Are y'all ready to flip Florida blue for the first time in 20 years? I'm proud to say that of the candidates running for governor, I'm the only one that has worn the uniform and served in our military. Fight for Florida. We are just three days away from electing a new governor. Who's got the edge? He's been there for 42 years. Nothing's happened. Whatever he says is simply not true. Senate showdown. Does Democrat Bill Nelson keep the seat or will Rick Scott flip it Republican? It's very important to vote. Not voting is like not breathing. Souls to the polls. Voter turnout today is big and overall it may set a record for a midterm election. Who does that benefit? Good morning. We are down to counting the hours for the results of this epic Florida midterm election with so much at stake. Is there ever? And that is our focus for the next hour. The candidates, the campaigns and the issues driving voters to the polls in very large numbers. Early voting ends at 7 o'clock this evening in Broward and Miami-Dade. So far today, we've seen a tidal wave of black voters. This is the ritual known as souls to the polls. First you go to church, then you go to your polling place. And these are live pictures from the North Dade Regional Library in Miami Gardens. By the time the polls close tonight, there and across the state, about five million Floridians, maybe more, will have cast their ballots, an unusually high number for a midterm election. So let's talk about that turnout and the key races and the candidates and the issues that have dominated this election cycle. Introductions first of our guests at the table with us, Sean Foreman, professor of political science at Barry University and a go-to guy for analysis on all things political. And Catherine DePaulo is a professor of political science at Florida International University and a keen observer of the political environment and its inhabitants. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being Good morning. here. Good morning. Exciting you. week, exhausting week for everybody. And about, uh, I think everyone's ready for it to be over. Absolutely, especially the commercials, yeah. uh, which power well, I don't these know, shows. That, that we like those commercials <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> but certainly the voters don't. I think they are, they are really more negative and more personal this year than they ever have been before. Yeah. Uh, Catherine, let me ask this question to both of you, but begin with you. We know from the famous Jesse Unruh quote, all politics is local, and Tip O'Neill as well. Uh, but in fact, because of President Trump, it seems he has nationalized this election, even with particular kind of races in Florida and South Florida. In many ways, it is a referendum, is it not, on President Trump? It is. It is all about Trump. And a lot of times the midterm elections are about the sitting president and how people feel about his, <clears throat> his administration excuse me, his policies. But certainly, if you look all around Florida, if it's the governor's race, the Senate race, congressional races, even state uh, House and Senate races right. are all about Trump. And, and particularly for Democrats, this is important that they, they vote against him. And the, uh, you know, the president has been here in Florida twice in a week. President Obama, of course, was here um, on Friday. But we were at, we were, our crew was in Estero um, earlier this mm -hmm. week, and, and the, uh, President Trump was in uh, Pensacola yesterday, but in Estero and again in Pensacola, the president was doing largely what he did in 2016, the big rallies that would just sell out crowds. It was kind of a, a, a negative speech. It was very a cautionary tale on what's to come. It Does that play, Sean Foreman, like it did in 2016? Well, that's what we'll see this week. The president thinks that it does. It worked for him in 2016. And the idea of nationalizing a congressional election really goes back to 1994. Newt Gingrich and Republicans did right. so effectively. And so that's part of the playbook is, of course, locally we look at issues and we look at personalities. Um, but the issues of immigration, of health care, of the economy, of um, opinions of the president, that's what's driving the, the turnout. So, yeah. uh, you know, um, <laughs> tr Trump Trump is doubling down on that, and that's what DeSantis is doing. Um, but it might be a new rule book this year. We don't know yet. Yeah. Sean, uh, we also know that Ron DeSantis has just, without reservation, tied his fate to President Trump. Everything that Trump has said, except for the death figures, the fatality figures on Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, that's the only thing I can really remember where he has differed with Trump. Everything else, total agreement and 
what he is saying is, if you like Trump, and if you like what Rick Scott did, I'm your guy for the next four years in Florida. Right. Well, he, he did break, uh, DeSantis did with Trump this week over the birthright citizenship issue in the 14th Amendment, saying that Trump probably can't do that as president. And no, but this whole idea is Trump's... Well, if, mm -hmm. I, can, if mm -hmm. I can interrupt you. Yes, he said it's probably unconstitutional. He didn't, I don't know, the way, the way I heard it was he didn't actually totally disagree with them. He simply was speaking in a lawyerly fashion and saying, uh, I don't think the courts would go along with it. That's a good point, Michael. He doesn't want to put too much separation between himself and the president. But, you know, to this larger point, they're running on fear. They're run, running on immigration and the caravan that's coming through Central America to Texas. It's not a Florida issue necessarily. While the economy is really strong, yeah. the national numbers, the Florida numbers, Rick Scott gets some of that. Um, but Trump's not playing that card. He's playing the fear card, and they feel that's what's going to motivate the voters. You yeah. know, in, in the gubernatorial election, which, you know, the Senate is actually a, a higher... Uh, seat of power, but boy, the Florida governor's race is sort of, to your point, the, the local person who's going to at least attempt to change the direction or keep the direction in Florida. And you have two men who, whose plans and policies could not be more different. Mm -hmm. and, and both of them are proven leaders in some ways. They are experienced. They, they have just different visions for how to go. Yet, Catherine, this race has been such a vilifying experience on for both of them. It's so negative. The narrative on both men from the other side is so horrible to listen to. What effect does that have on voters? Well, it has been a very nasty race, even in the debates. Uh, it was more like a schoolyard brawl, frankly, uh, than we heard about any of the substantive issues that separate them. And we haven't really ha heard issues, even though we know, you know there are serious issues that separate these candidates. It's really been more about uh, personality and I think the way that they interact with each other, interact with voters. And they've really, I think, appealed to the base. They are trying to get their base voters out. And mm -hmm. so I think part of the effect is, what is how is this going to play with, with NPAs, with the independent voters who are really going to decide this race. Yeah, well, how, how do you think it will? Yeah. Well, I, well, went in for the follow-up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, because some of the polls would suggest perhaps that, that Gillum is, is slightly ahead in that, that way. But again, if we go back to 2016, I think there are a lot of um, independents who swung for Trump that still might, in, in some of these uh, more rural parts of Florida, still stick with, with the Republican Party. So it's going to be, I think, very hard to tell, but it's a very close race, if nothing else. Yeah, Sean, 27 percent of voters in the state of Florida are NPA, no party affiliation. And I saw that same poll this morning, and it appears most of them, the majority, are breaking towards Gillum and maybe Nelson, but certainly... Uh, towards Gillum, but since they didn't vote in the primaries and finding a pattern in their voting is hard, I mean, until Tuesday night, we really won't know how they've gone. We won't. And the only way we know how independents vote is to ask them in polls and then exit polls when they're leaving the uh, polling place. So we'd never get a really good grip on this. And there are other polls that show that uh, the Republicans are getting independent vote. So, right. uh, you know, but, you know, this idea that the Senate race is not getting as much attention, uh, that's going to be probably the most expensive Senate race in history, and that's going to impact the majority outcome. But I think people are more interested in Gillum and DeSantis because they're new, fresh faces, and they're they're really making a push to bring new voters in where people already know Nelson and Scott. You know, let me ask you about that. The, the Senate race up until, I think, yesterday was Nelson plus 2.9, which is a dead heat, really. And right now it's one. What's happened in the last 24 hours that would move a poll, that that's close, even closer? Yeah, I don't know there's anything that happened this week. Uh, People say that it tightens up that people go back home to their parties that they were going to support anyway. Uh, maybe Governor Scott's getting some pluses from handling of the hurricane overall. Uh, but you're right, it's two percent for Gillum and, and Nelson in these polls that they're ahead. Uh, we know that the last two governor and presidential elections have been one percent uh, margin difference. Uh, some people th say that possibly Gillum could win and Scott could win, which would really be odd. Yes, right? it would. So it's going to be really yeah. tight. Either. You know, wh why though would that be odd? Because, I mean, it, it is a base election. We're talking mm -hmm. parties. The, the head of, voting for the head of a state, you're voting for the CEO of your state. Voting for a member of Congress or the Senate is almost sort of making the balance of power for national decisions. 
to me, that's that's almost like a whole different conversation. Well, as we were talking about nationalizing these elections, uh, I think when you have Gillum and DeSantis that have really nationalized the sort of Trump-Sanders wing of, of both of their political parties, this is why that race has become more exciting than perhaps the Senate race. And of course, yeah. Scott and Nelson aren't the most charismatic, exciting candidates, um, but certainly Gillum and DeSantis are. And one quick thing about the polls, that is a statistical dead heat. So in terms of methodology, that really means, uh, you know, Gillum uh, could be could not be a um, sure. in any of these polls or vice versa. So something to watch. Talk about more about the polls when we come right back. Stay with us. Welcome back live in our studio this morning to political experts, Catherine DiPaolo of FIU and Sean Foreman from Barry. Uh, let me ask you both, but Sean, let me begin with you. On the subject of polls, I happen to have been speaking with a very knowledgeable political guy last night uh, who is in government, and he was asking me who was ahead, who wasn't, and I sent out a poll, and he said, wait a minute, I'm just not paying any attention to polls 2016 turned me off on polls. Um, you know, I think, let me ask you to sort of expound. All polls are not uh, created alike. I mean, you have the kind of polls where you're called and you punch a button on your phone, it's automated, or you have a live person talking to a likely voter with a big sample. I mean, that's yes. the kind of poll that you can 
find more reliable. Well, the bigger the sample, the more reliable it is. Uh, Catherine mentioned the methodology before the commercial break. There's an issue of who you're polling, how many Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, how many white, black, Hispanic. Right. English, uh, Spanish. Sure. That's right, uh, in, in ages. So you have to get it in a way that um, mirrors the electorate. And so they're done based on past electorates. We're not sure who's going to show up this time, so there's already an issue there. And then, you know, groups are trying to get different results in some cases because they want to show somebody ahead. So right. all of this, you have to take them with a grain of salt. So that's a, what, what we would call a push-pull. You ask a question in such a way to elicit a certain answer. But then there's this, this sort of big um, question mark, are people being truthful when they're polled? And, and I remember in 2016, in covering President, now President Trump's campaign, I met people who flat out and said to me they would be voting for President Trump. They're not going to tell anyone about it, though. And mm -hmm. so how do you know someone who's being polled is giving you an accurate answer? Well, and I, I think that's particularly a, pr a problem with Republican voters who I, I think don't answer the phones, don't answer the polls. Um, and I, I think really... If you, if you see in the electorate, they're not talking out loud very much either. So I think when we look at these polls, we're surprised perhaps when a Republican wins a race like in 2016. Uh, but when you're conducting these particular polls, they, these are the kinds of things that you need to look for because you've got to change the weight then. We didn't get enough Hispanic votes. But then that has its own issues. So I think when we look at maybe averages are helpful, but you know, really kind of taking some of this with a grain of salt, as, as uh, Sean mentioned, is really how we have to look at it, particularly when it's in that margin of error. Yeah. I, I remember, I'm old enough to remember, a columnist in Chicago named Mike Royko, who was very funny, uh, who w wrote a column once before an election and said, I love talking to pollsters because I always lie to them. I give them <laughs> right. the wrong answer. Yeah. Right. Something, let, something. Let uh, me say, though, that uh, on the statewide races, I have Republican friends who tell me internally their polls are consistent, also showing that they're down 2%. Yeah. Uh, DeSantis is. So they feel that these are accurate, and they actually feel kind of good about that, that they can make up on Election Day. Right. Um, yeah, so, so what does that mean, make it up on Election Day? How do you make something up on Election Day? So now that we have early voting and, and uh, mail-in ballots are easy to do, people have options to vote. What we've seen since 2004 is that is not increasing overall turnout in Florida. We have, have relatively the same amount of turnout. People just vote early um, rather than on Election Day. So you make it up by getting your voters who you expect to vote who haven't gone early yet to get out yeah. there on Tuesday. All right, well, today we are looking at early vote. I mean, the last day of um, early voting, and it is souls to the polls. and. There is, I mean, it's really encouraging, a big turnout. And uh, Catherine, by the end of the day, I think more than 5 million, there are 13 million registered voters in the state. To think that, that more than 5 million, and here are the figures right now, uh, this was, uh, well, I guess these are the current figures, 4.8 million. Uh, I find that very encouraging that this many uh, voters have really been turned on, not turned off by those negative TV ads or the candidates, they've come out to vote. It's amazing. I, you know, usually in a midterm election, you have the party out of power from the White House, who is very energized. They usually come out to vote, which is why usually this is difficult for the president's party to win seats. But you see both Republicans and Democrats energized, and people, I think, are really excited about this election. Um, those numbers are tremendous in, in early voting, and the fact that it's so close between Republicans and Democrats yeah. is going to be a nail-biter. The, the Democrats, in fact, have sort of shown come back. They were 1.3% yes. uh, behind the Republicans on early voting and by mail voting. Now it seems like there's parity. Right. I think Democrats are behind 2014 pace but ahead of 2016 pace. What we're seeing is that there are more white voters in Florida voting. We don't know which party they're siding with. Right. But we're also seeing there are more younger people. There are more uh, Hispanics. Um, there are more independents. We yeah. just don't know which way they're breaking. Do, do you Look, think we, the Parkland, I'm sorry, do you yeah. think those Parkland kids are going to, maybe that was your question. Uh, kind of, yeah. <laughs> do you think those Parkland kids and that generation who historically have not voted in big numbers, are they going to turn out? 
That's the big question. You know, they're not turning out in, in the heavy percentages in the early vote compared to the other age uh, groups. So right. I think that remains to be seen. Perhaps maybe in South Florida here where this, this event happened, I think there's a lot of young people, uh, mm -hmm. especially with all these early voting locations at the, at the college campuses this right. time around. But I'd, I'm not sure that they're going to sh show up in these amazing numbers that are going to you know, turn an election. Well, you know, you both are professors. You teach classes. You have those, you know, <laughs> millennials. What are you hearing from them? What do they say? What do they do? Some are excited. Uh, I kind of expected more excitement, actually, on campus. We had uh, Gillum and, and Nelson and others, and I was surprised by the crowd. It wasn't quite as big as I thought it would have been. Wow. Yeah. And you? Uh, we, we usually have the few who are committed and involved in campaigns and the rest who just watch. And no and difference spectators. this time no, with all no. that's gone on? The intensity is greater amongst those who are already intense. So I think on the Parkland and other students in general, you, the ones who were going to register to vote anyway did so. They're a little more energized, but I'm not sure that they brought yeah. more people with yeah. them. Yeah, very, very quickly if we can. Catherine, is there anything about the election cycle that has surprised you where something has happened, something's been said, where you've kind of reeled back and said, whoa, I didn't expect that? Oh, to not expect something. Uh, every day, I think there are things that, that, <laughs> that pop up that are unexpected. Uh, one thing I, I think, if we talk about Ron DeSantis, who started the day after the primary election with the monkey this up comment, I think it has really damaged him. It was surprising that he said that, and I don't know that yeah. he'll recover from that. Sean? Oh, gosh. I was also going to say the governor's race, that, that actually that race hasn't been more of an issue. I know it has been, but I really thought that we'd hear it get even worse. Yeah. I think there's something every day that surprises yeah. us. All right. Sean Foreman, <laughs> Catherine DiPaolo, thank you so much for coming in. Enjoyed it. Your expertise. Up next, we bring in the roundtable. Stay with us.
Time now for the Power Roundtable Special Election Edition. And we have a great one for you today. Some of the best and brightest in our South Florida area. Rosemary O'Hara, an old friend, editorial page editor of the Sun Sentinel, veteran Florida journalist. Another great friend, Nancy Ancrem, editorial page editor of the Miami Herald, and Justin Safey. Yes, a another third great, great friend, friend. <laughs> publisher of the online Safey Review and a principal with Ballard Partners in Washington. To all of you, great to have you. Good morning. You Good, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Anyone sleep this week yet? Uh, <laughs> after Tuesday. No. Or, or Wednesday. Yeah, we'll or Thursday. Right. Hopefully. Maybe. Or Friday. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about those close numbers. Justin, you mm -hmm. know, you're, you're in Washington, you come down now, right. you're on the ground. I'm following it. What, what's your read on this with these numbers? Well, so my close? read is is uh, the number of people who voted early, we're probably, we've already broken a record on that in the mm -hmm. history of the state of Florida. Uh, you know, we've heard talk about blue waves and red waves. And what I'm seeing in the early voting numbers is there's a red wave and a blue wave. Mm -hmm. Both um, Republicans and Democrats are turning out. And I think that uh, by the end of early voting today, by the time the polls close today, the Democrats are probably going to have a 10 or 20 a thousand vote advantage over Republicans. So really what that tells me is that I know everyone says this, but I really believe this, that Tuesday, who shows up on Tuesday is going to actually probably make decide this all these the statewide races and also which way the independent voters break and how big is the advantage either side with the independent voters. Wow. So what about, you know, both of the Miami Herald, the Sun Sentinel have done and and of course, save your review, mm -hmm. the get out the vote campaign has been huge. So the independent vote, and there are the third party voters also, but the independent vote is really hard to read this time yeah. because there are, the, the polls are pretty close, depending on who's, as we talked about in the first couple of segments, depending on who's doing the polling and who's asking the questions. So Rosemary, what do you see as the issue for independence? There's, there's the economy, there's health care, we've been talking about that. What is the issue that the independents are going to say, you know, here's my vote? Gosh, there's so many, and they're independent because they don't just line up behind one cause or one party. There's the environment. There's the blue-green algae and the red mm -hmm. tide. There's gun rights. There's economy. There's the immigration, you know, the caravan at so the border. So you don't see one overarching, you know, I, I can't decide both of these great ideas, but this is the one that I'm really going to go for. Well, uh, the polls, the cross tabs show that the independents appear to be breaking toward the Democrats. But this is the first time we're hearing from the independents, and that's a shame that the primaries in Florida do not allow independents to be heard. Yeah. We would better understand what they care about, and our leaders would better be able to address the issues all of Florida care about if we let listen to independents. Yeah. And editorially, Absolutely. you have said that, right. I think, yeah. Nancy. I mean, Absolutely. And and I happen to, to agree with you. Again. We're going to hammer that again. I think Rosemary's right. There are so many issues that are, are of importance to independents that I think Ultimately, Tuesday, Election Day, it's going to get down to their gut, their yeah. individual mm -hmm. guts. And actually, I think that's how at least the gubernatorial candidates are playing it. Yeah. The issues have taken a back seat to, to personalities them, to and, personalities yeah. and to them trying to convey yeah. just who they are. How, that is so important, too, because, I mean, I've talked to voters who have flat out said, I just don't like him. And that, that's not for any one right. particular person. But the, the follow-up to that is, well, whether you like or dislike somebody, what about the platform and the plan and the ability to move the needle? You know, I just don't like them. Well, a lot of times people vote on feeling and they vote on likability, and this is an old rule in, in politics. Yeah. And, and you mentioned in the earlier segment that to some extent this is, and I believe it is a, it's a referendum on, on President Trump. At the same time, if you look at the TV ads, it seems like the other issue that's really being pressed pretty hard, at least by the Democrats, is the issue of health care. And even in some Republican mm -hmm. ads as well. So I think that amongst independents, that health care issue may yeah. may be very high on their agenda. Well, I, I was at the, the last gubernatorial debate up there at Broward College, and uh, that was, aside from the personal insult and attacks on each other, that was just utterly fascinating to me because, um, you know, what Ron DeSantis is saying is, okay, yeah, I voted against the Affordable Care Act, but I'm going to make sure that everybody with pre-existing conditions uh, is going to be covered. 
and I will ask the legislature to do it if Congress doesn't. And frankly, I kind of heard that and I thought, mm. whoa, how do you do that? Well, you would do it. I, I mean, it is remarkable to me that um, Senator or uh, Governor Scott and Ron DeSantis are both saying that they will stand up for pre existing conditions right. when, as a congressman, DeSantis did everything he could to get the Affordable Care Act repealed. Governor Scott emerged on the national stage yeah. fighting the Affordable Care Act, That's right. yep. and neither one of them has said that Florida should get out of this lawsuit that Attorney General Pam Bondi is pushing that would end the requirement that s says insurance companies can't discriminate against people mm -hmm. with pre-existing conditions. So they're wrapping themselves in their big protector of this, and their whole history says the opposite. Absolutely. You, you, you know, I think both parties are running that campaign of fear. And it's just more overt when it comes to the Republicans, but also the Democrats are saying, this is what you, our base, have, have to fear. Well, right. and also, and, the, the, by, Justin, I was going to ask yeah. you this, the, the Democrats are saying, well, elect Gillum governor and we will expand Medicaid and accept, accept federal money, but that's actually not exactly possible without the legislature. Well, that's true. I mean, but the, the, the issue of health care is really interesting because then you have Andrew Gillum, Democratic candidate for governor, who is supporting the Medicare for all concept. And again, the governor can't institute Medicare for right, all, right. Uh, but, but he would say that he wants to expand Medicaid and there are a lot of Democrats in the legislature would like to do that, but Republicans would not. And the other thing is, is it was interesting when President Obama came here, he did um, go negative um, and use fear when he basically said, they're coming after your health care. That was probably one of the biggest lines that he had in his speech, which basically meant the, the Republicans are going to take your health care away. So I think that that's been one of the more effective But um, he also tactics. made the point that the Republicans also used the fear and starting back with when they said that we were going to have death panels. They accused me of, now we were going to have death panels that are going to take health care away from your grandma. Yeah, well now he's kind of doing the same thing. Because when you say someone's going to take away your health care, you're basically implying you're going to die or something yeah. bad's going to happen now to you. Now it's personal. All right, yeah. time out. Got a lot to talk about. <laughs> Stay with us. <laughs>
Welcome back. We are in the middle of our roundtable here. Justin Safey, Nancy Ancrum, Rosemary O'Hara. And I think we've got some live pictures we want to show you. Uh, candidate uh, Andrew Gillum, there he is, is speaking at North Miami Senior High School. Uh, let's listen in for a minute, hear what he's saying. We're going to elevate that message come Tuesday, November 6th. And it will operate right here in the state of Florida as we work to bring this thing on home. Um, I'm here today, uh, one, thanks to all my elected official and appointed official colleagues who are here. These are folks uh, who, who, who toil in the field on your behalf every single day. I know them all personally. Well, uh, having, here is Andrew Gillum doing what politicians always do. You've got to thank <laughs> all of the other politicians <laughs> who are there <laughs> helping to make this possible. Uh, you know, Justin, let me ask you, I think that one of the things that has impressed me with the Gillum campaign is that they have not conceded the normally red areas of the state, Volusia County or other parts of the county that, of the state that normally vote uh, Republican, he has gone to them, and in fact, he's gotten pretty good turnout. He has, and uh, I got a text from a, an old colleague of mine who worked with me in Governor Bush's office who now works in the Northeast of the United States. He said, is this a bad sign for the Republicans that Gillum is campaigning in the panhandle and he was in yeah. the panhandle? Yeah. And I said, you know what? This is a very a broad-based campaign strategy because typically at this point in the campaign with three or four days left, you'd be focusing on where he is today right. in Dade County, but the Democratic base in the state of Florida is Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. There's right. so many Democratic votes there. Right. You more, than be a million, uh, more than a million Democratic voters registered in Palm Beach, uh, Broward, and Miami-Dade County, and Monroe as well. Yeah, Ron, mm -hmm. Ron DeSantis has spent a lot of time in Dade County mm -hmm. uh, in the past couple of weeks, and specifically in the Cuban-American neighborhoods where he's going to have a reliable vote. But uh, he was at the Black Professionals Summit a couple of weeks ago, um, which I thought was a really interesting place for him to go to take on what has become the perception of he is, you know, either clueless at best or a racist at worst. And I don't, frankly, having spoken to him, think either of those things are true. But Nancy, he has really um, failed to come out and be as inclusive as maybe he really is. The perception of Ron DeSantis is that he is not inclusive in the African-American neighborhoods, from what we're hearing. Yes, and I don't think that that is a DeSantis issue. I think that is a Republican issue, and I think it is usually a deliberate and exclusionary approach so that they do not turn off their base. Mm -hmm. And so I wish I could say I was really, really impressed. But he also was speaking to people who often do vote Republican, and these, this is, these are business leaders, these are professionals. So it, I give him some credit, but it was not that much of a stretch for him. Uh, the main issue, one of the main issues for former Congressman DeSantis, of course, is low taxes. I mean, he, I think, is some, simply saying, as I said earlier in the show, uh, that if you like Rick, Rick Scott's economic policies, you like low taxes, you don't want to raise the corporate uh, tax rate in the state of Florida, I'm your guy. So uh, here is Congressman DeSantis talking about why low taxes are important. Listen in. I think most independents want Florida to remain a low tax state. And with me, you can take that to the bank. We will remain a low tax state. And I think that will allow us to prosper more economically. You know, the, uh, the whole tax issue, uh, we have also a uh, sound from Andrew Gillum talking about that because his plan for education is raising the corporate tax rate. Um, let's talk about that after we listen to how Andrew Gillum frames that idea. We want you to put a billion dollars into paying teachers what they're worth, into allowing us to build trade programs that train the future workforce to walk into the jobs that they're creating. This really may be the most audacious and interesting idea that Gillum has proposed. And if you think about Jeb Bush or you think about basically any governor, they have been focused, laser focused, on bringing down corporate tax rates and making Florida an attractive state for industry, for relocation or to keep industry here. 
I mean, how do you think this plays? A couple things. Very remarkable. One, Jeb Bush, Rick Scott, both governors, Republican, got reelected cutting taxes. So they got rewarded by the voters for doing that. Uh, if you look at Democratic candidates who've run in the state of Florida, I don't remember another Democratic candidate until Andrew Gillum, who's run basically saying, I'm going to raise your taxes. Um, corporate taxes in this instance, but he linked it to education. So I think it kind of represents a sea change, and it is a little bit of a gamble. And I have to give Andrew Gillum credit for basically saying, I'm going to raise taxes um, and trying to convince the, the voters of the right. state to vote for him despite that the but, fact that but that. It, he's saying it would be on three percent he would it's on the biggest employers right. so it's a very limited pool i would also point out that across florida at least in 19 counties we are raising ta we are raising taxes right. at the local level because tallahassee continues to cut underfund. Un underfund the public schools so raising taxes is on the ballot at, in so many counties and finally i would raise the point that in washington we cut taxes for corporations and and now we are seeing the deficit just grow i mean that used to be the issue for republicans was how in debt we are and so now we're looking at having to cut medicare and social security yeah. because we got to do something about the deficit so in this race and on the local level that is such a complicated calculation and a complicated equation. And, and you're right, Gillen, Gillum has come out and said, well, you know, raising taxes, but for this many people. But I think the average voter just hears raising tax, right. lowering <clears throat> tax, and that becomes the headline. Well, he's betting on the average voter also hearing for education, mm -hmm. which has not been fully funded since Rick Scott has been in office, which has not really been as effective for the public schools as charter schools have received more and more of a chunk of of public funds and revenue that these tax pay, taxpayers are already paying into the pool. Right. Right now, Florida, so about $7,400 goes per pupil in the state. And it is at a high, but it still puts us like 44th in the country right. in per pupil funding. Se so. 7000 7,400. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. All right, everybody, hold your thoughts again. We'll be back with more Roundtable in just a minute.
Welcome back. We are in the midst of a roundtable with a really great panel. And let's look for a, a minute or two at least at the Senate race because it is just key to what happens in the state of Florida. Rosemary, uh, yesterday your page in the Sun Sentinel wrote a long and I thought very powerfully argued editorial in which you said, among other things, that uh, Rick Scott financially has just not been transparent, that his blind trust is not so blind, and that he has been conflicted in his, his wealth, and he, of course, is a tremendously wealthy guy, uh, over the last eight years, and it's affected both his decisions, public policy decisions. Well, we know that the only way we know how, what his finances are is because, because to run for Senate, he's had to disclose them. Yeah. As it turns out, the blind trust is not so blind. The person who runs his trust is the person who used to run his trust before he, he put it in. And his wife, there's amazing similarities, coincidences between the governor's blind trust and his wife's investments. And they are in, um, investing in companies that who have issues before Florida government. During the course of his governorship, his wealth has increased two hundred million dollars. So um, it's 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 done well. Um, but I wanted to just say something about the difference between his campaign and what we're talking about at the governor's yeah. level. We've, as you mentioned, we've seen Ron DeSantis and Andrew Gillum across the state in different places, but we've not seen Bill Nelson and we've not seen Rick Scott. All of their campaigning is really being done on television. And the governor is, has put $60 million into this campaign in order to get his message out in those sound bites. You know, the, the amount of money is staggering in that campaign. And Justin, these are both incumbents, an incumbent governor and an incumbent senator. And there have been plenty of opportunities, most recently with the hurricanes, for them to use that office in a very publicly noticeable way. And it seems like the governor is sort of outdoing the senator in that account. Well, it's a little bit easier in the governor. We saw Jeb Bush during the hurricane, Charlie Chris, Rick Scott. I mean, when you're the governor, you're kind of in charge of hurricane recovery and response. So I think that made it a little bit easier. I, I did remember seeing Bill Nelson you know, on television yeah. a few times, and you know he was doing what he could to make sure he was being responsive. But you know, look, Florida is a huge state. We have 20 million people. We have 13 million voters. Uh, these That race, that U.S. Senate race, is going to be over $100 million spent. The outside yeah. groups have spent, third party groups, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, have spent $30 million against Bill Nelson and over $30 million against Rick Scott. Yeah. So these are just astronomical numbers. Yeah. And Nancy, um, the theme of what Governor Scott says on the campaign trail when he's out there and what his ads say basically is Bill Nelson is confused, which is a euphemism for old, right. over-the-hill, doddering, let's get him out of there, we need to get rid of, you know, full-time uh, uh, politicians, right. and he is mm -hmm. one. You think that's going to resonate? I don't think it's going to resonate. I think people will see it for what it is if you are not inclined to vote for Rick Scott in the first place. Will it resonate with independents? I just don't know. Yeah. I do think that both of these candidates are, yes, using television as their surrogates, but also hoping that either President Trump or former President Obama will be the wind beneath their wings to, yeah. to get them well, over the finish and, line. And we did see here as video, in fact, from a really exciting, I thought, very well done rally on Friday in Overtown, in Miami's Overtown neighborhood. And there you see uh, President, former President Obama and uh, Bill Nelson there on his right, Andrew Gillum on his left. But you know, uh, Justin, it seems to me, uh, I don't want to sound too judgmental, Bill Nelson has just not been, you know, firing up the crowds. He has been kind of a, uh, to use a phrase from 2016, a low energy candidate. Well, he's been very, another way of saying it would be very senatorial. Uh, we have possibly another way, <laughs> another way of saying it. Right? That's, that's, that's generous. That's, that's generous. Very generous. But, you know, it, it's true. And that, look, and if he loses, if Bill Nelson loses, it's going to be one of the reasons will be because he has not had a very vigorous uh, presence in the 
state of Florida since he's been in the last six years since he got reelected last time. Yeah. That's definitely going to hurt him and maybe the reason why he yeah. loses. Well, and the other reason he could lose is that Governor Scott is putting $12 million into his television campaign advertising in this time. last week, which is exactly what he did against Charlie Crist in the last week of that campaign, yeah. came from behind and won by one percentage point. This race is going to be a squeaker. Yeah. You know, you are mentioning the, the, the national money, yes. all the national yeah. money into this. The, I mean, the whole balance of power in the U.S. Right, House and Senate right. is on the line. We haven't even talked about the congressional races, right. uh, districts number 25, 6, and 7 in South Dade, where two of those are toss-ups that are now Republican seats. Or And so that national money has uh, shows Florida is a... A, a bellwether state Absolutely. for this election. I think that's what one of the things that propelled Donna Shalala into the congressional race to replace Ileana Rosalatnin, the fact that she had a name that could draw national funding, mm -hmm. and you could see it in the ads that were running that, that popped up on, on, on Facebook and on the internet and on Google, um, with the expectation that that is really where the money was going. Well, the other from. thing is the p balance of power in Washington is on a nice edge, both in the Senate and in the House. And we are really ground zero here in Florida between the U.S. Senate race. If the Republicans can win that race, they're taking away a seat from a Democrat. And with these uh, battleground districts that we have here in Dade County, those are that could decide whether the Democrats or Republicans yeah. control the U.S. House of Representatives. Boy, that is a good point on which to end. Justin, Nancy, yeah. Rosemary, thanks so much. Thank you good for to coming see you. in. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
take a look at this four cam forecast. A look from our tower cams across South Florida at what's shaping up to be a pretty day after that storm last night. It wow. looks very nice out there. And here is Weather Authority meteorologist Brandon Orr with the official Sunday forecast. Brandon. Yeah, it's not looking too bad at all outside. In fact, we have a decent amount of sunshine. In fact, so much sun that we're warming up quick. Temperatures are already as high as 87 degrees. Check it out over there in Pembroke Pines. 85 in Fort Lauderdale factor in the humidity. This is what it actually feels like though. 94 degrees Pembroke Pines down towards Hialeah feels like the middle 90s. Uh, it doesn't feel like November out there, but it certainly is. And this humidity sparking off a sh few showers with the front that's been lifting off towards the north. A lot of these have been over the Everglades, so that's why I only have a 20% shot at getting a shower today. You can see over west and there's been a couple of quick showers inland. Down towards the Keys around Marathon, we have a couple of showers too. High temperatures today, we're here. 86 degrees pretty much, and we're going to stay there for the next few hours. And we're going to stay there pretty much all week long. It's a very hot week ahead and low rain chances. No big storm systems nearby, guys. Perfect weather for voting. Thanks, Brandon. If you haven't voted yet, please go do so. With all that we've talked about today, there is no bigger power that a Floridian has right now than to cast the that power vote. Of, of your vote, if you haven't done it, please go out there uh, by 7 o'clock this evening in Miami-Dade and Broward or vote on Tuesday on Election Day. We certainly know you will, and thank you for joining us. Remember, as always, stay informed. Get involved. Remember, you can subscribe to our Roundtable podcast right there and see any of our programs online all the time. Stay tuned for SoFlo Health right here next.